Hi, my name is David Hildebrand, and I'm Chair of Philosophy and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Colorado, Denver. My talk is entitled, The Quest for Absolute Sound, What are the Philosophical Stakes for Audiophiles? So most people have met an audiophile at one point in their life. They've encountered weird monolithic speakers, glowing amplifiers, and a viper's nest of cables. What seems like mere fetishism from the outside is actually a complicated crossroads of acoustics, technological devices, engineering, aesthetic evaluation, consumerism, psychological listening habits. So what is an audiophile? Well, audiophiles are people who love music and people who love sound. They're deeply invested in time and usually in money in pushing their knowledge, their equipment, and their physical spaces to yield experiences with sound and music which are immersive. Some seek transparency, some seek transcendence, and some just can't get a date. So over the past 18 months, right, during COVID, I found myself enmeshed in the audiophile world. I've researched, I've listened, I put together a pretty good system. This is required, learning a reasonable amount about brands, about audio component and speaker design, about cables and power considerations, and room acoustics. I've learned how to measure my room acoustically. I've learned how to construct acoustic panels. I've learned how to position and audition audio gear. I've learned how to describe what I've heard, and I've learned how to write about it. I've done two speaker reviews, and I even filmed one for YouTube. So my participation in audio forums, which was part of my process of learning this stuff, really connected me with a lot of knowledgeable hobbyists, experts, and dealers, as well as with posers, propagandists, peacocks, and schoolyard bullies. I made a couple friends, too. So while this felt a little bit like playing hooky from philosophy, I found myself constantly coming up with philosophical questions. The only difference was that I was asking experts and hobbyists rather than other philosophers. I was embedded. So much of the time, forum issues pivoted on a certain concept or a certain debate, which to my mind would be more profitably pursued philosophically. So along with Stephen Hale, I wondered, what is it that audiophiles are aiming at to achieve with this expensive hobby? What are the aesthetic aims of audiophiles? There has been next to zero philosophical investigation into these issues. So Hale's quest is mine too, and this presentation will not proceed with extensive argument on a single issue, but will rather aim to demonstrate why the audiophile's hobby is fertile terrain for, for philosophical haymaking. I'm going to introduce three audiophile interests or debates, general areas, and then I'm going to describe a couple of ways that I think each area might be enhanced by looking into some of the philosophical issues laying underneath the surface. So those three areas are, one, objective measurement versus subjective description, and this is roughly should reproduced music or gear uh, be evaluated with objective measurement or subjective description. The second issue is objects versus environments, and this is essentially the question is why is audio gear so overemphasized, even to the neglect of what all in the hobby acknowledge is very, very important, namely the room or the environment. Third, I want to look at the general issue of realism versus constructivism, and in this context that boils down to what should musical reproduction aim at? Is the best ideal realism or transparency, or is it rather the fulfillment of desires, even if that means the concoction or the construction of musical experiences? What does this do to our window onto the musical performance or work of art? So objective measurement. Uh, the first audiophile debate that we'll consider concerns whether gear and reproduced music should be evaluated using objective measurement or subjective description. So there's a debate in the audio community, and on one level of this debate, there are factual disputes. Some claim that objective measurements are adequate to evaluate audio gear quality. So, for example, Ethan Weiner argues that, quote, everything that audi audibly affects electronic gear can easily be measured and to a much higher resolution than human ears can hear. There are, he continues, only four parameters needed to define everything that affects the fidelity of audio equipment. Noise, 
frequency response, distortion, and time-based errors. Such measurements, he continues, are more accurate and reliable than hearing. Other experts, such as Robert Harley, stake out diametrically opposed positions. Harley argues that the most important indicator of an audio product's worth are subjective and experiential elements that objective measurements will never reveal. Audio engineering practice, Harley continues, has both superficial and real goals which are too often conflated. He writes, the superficial goal is to provide wide bandwidth low distortion, high signal-to-noise ratio, etc. In other words, good measurements. The real goal is to provide an engaging emotional musical experience. It is a fundamental and tragic error to mistake the superficial goal for the real goal. Listening is not a rejection of scientific measurement. So each side in this debate often impugns the methods, motives, and self-awareness of the other. Commenting on tests which show no objective or quantifiable differences on equipment before and after modifications, Weiner comments, yet even when a difference cannot be measured or defies the laws of physics, some people still insist they can hear an improvement. Beliefs, expectation, bias, and the placebo effect are very strong. Harley, too, stands his ground. He says, unlike other endeavors, however, where the result of science is more obvious, the measurement of a bridge's strength, for example, audio reproduction is different in that the goal of good audio engineering, the satisfying communication of musical experience, is an intensely personal event that defies analysis by scientific method. This situation, in which the result of science cannot be quantified by any scientifically acceptable measure, offers an opportunity to explore the relationship between science and human experience. So if we think about the philosophical issues and we view these debates through the lens of philosophy of technology, the tension will probably feel familiar to you. Is audio technology a tool and for the discovery of what already exists in physical nature? Or is it a tool of measurement that's prefigured by our subjective needs to suit <clears throat> manipulations and interpretations of our choosing? In one case, the book of nature is there, fixed in character, ready to read. And if we read it properly, we'll gain knowledge and mastery. Reality is found. Take the other tack, and we're already transacting with nature. While our will and our desires encounter resistance from time to time, we have enormous latitude in our selections, in our interpretations, in our evaluations. Reality is, by and large, made. One other place to explore, I think, besides ontology is, is audiophile phenomenology. What is present to consciousness in the experience of a sound, a note, a soundscape, or a noise? Are these experienced as mental events only, or are they present, present as enacted in the body, as Mark Johnson might argue? To what degree can physical measurement account for the varieties of ways that such phenomena can be taken up into experience? Another topic concerns taste among audiophiles, or the construction of audiophile taste, because the conflict between objective metrics and aesthetic judgment in audio really harkens us back to Hume's example about wine tasting. And so here the question is, to what degree is taste accounted for by measurement? To what degree should we consider our tastes based on measurement? So anyone who's gotten on a scale and been reminded that perhaps they love donuts just a little too much has experienced the idea that measurement can help us reconsider our tastes. So this could work in audio, too, if the metrics were trusted to be relevant in experience. So let me just raise a couple of thoughts about the foregoing. I suspect that a number of dualisms are helping to keep these audiophile debates going. So if I threw a dart at a solution, it would probably be to reframe the starting point of audio as not differentiated into either objective metrics or subjective opinion. All descriptions, whether they're number or narrative, happen for pragmatic reasons, and doors can be left open to revise them if habits and purposes are made explicit. 
I think also fueling the intransigence of this debate is the mind-body and reason-feeling dualisms. This could be redressed with help from novelists like Robert Piercig or psychologists like Antonio Damasio, philosophers like John Dewey and Mark Johnson, because for these figures, analyses of human beings into mind and body has outlived its usefulness. Section 2, Objects versus Environments, or Gear Love. The question here is, should realizing sonic goals rely predominantly upon objects, gear, or environment, room, listener, etc.? I want to consider here, then, the heavy emphasis placed on gear, what the late Walter Becker of Steely Dan called GAS, Gear Acquisition Syndrome. So virtually all agree about the crucial role of room acoustics. Still, so much emphasis rests upon objects that it seems that something philosophical might be at stake. So what's the issue here in the audio community? Well, I mean, in market co economies with many options, the need for discrimination criteria regarding objects is obvious. What's harder to understand is the degree to which room acoustics is overlooked or underestimated for people who are consciously trying to get good sound. Why would they ignore the room? As Ethan Weiner puts it, acoustic treatment is destined to be the next big thing in the field of audio production, but it won't happen until a lot more people appreciate the importance of their room's acoustic properties. Acoustic treatment is the most important gear you'll ever own. Gear fetishism might be at work here, and uh, there was a humorous article by uh, Jay Zellinger years back who wrote in an essay that gear lust is really about the displacement of sensual pleasure, and he wrote that audiophiles show an extraordinary preoccupation with hi-fi equipment for its own sake. They attach an enormous significance to audio equipment's capacity to induce sonic pleasure, and they relegate the music itself to a secondary position. He relates the hi-fi enthusiast to the sexual fetishist who endows an inanimate object with magical powers not normally assigned to it. And he reminds readers, but audio components do not possess any magical properties. They are under the control of the laws of physics. So there are a number of obvious forces likely at work in gear lust. One might be the insistence of marketing, one might be status signaling, maybe it's the beauty of these objects, or perhaps it's the haptic pleasure of touching and manipulating them. Let's face it, room panels, flooring, and other environmental adjustments just can't compete with that kind of eye candy. Yet, if we consider the kind of effort that people go to to redo their kitchens and living rooms with rugs and carpets, windows and paint and so forth, these are all environmental. People understand that focal practices only flourish in spaces that are properly appointed. So the question remains, why are audio so disconnected from environment? So beyond the sociological and psychological explanations, philosophers of technology might look in several places. One might be to look at Albert Borgman's idea of devices and focal practices. In Borgman's idea of the device paradigm, he helps to explain the allure and the overemphasis upon stuff, and in this case it would be on audio gear. These are devices which, like, like devices in Borgman's account, they provide nearly instantaneous disburdening, right? They give us what we want immediately. So like a thermostat just brings heat, audio gear just brings music. And what's rendered moot, focal things and practices such as listening to music and the space in which we inhabit, are often not explicit. So this is what I've been referring to as the environment. Another philosophical issue is just this general tension between seeing the world in terms of individuals uh, versus in terms of ecological systems, right? It's plausible to suppose that a general prejudice towards individuals over systems inclines individuals towards objects rather than dynamic environments. The third thing to mention might be something like gender roles, all right? Because while music appeals to everyone, the realm of audio technology is predominantly male. A recent dissertation to examine this phenomena of gender imbalance and argued that gear fetishism can be in part explained by male hegemony and the perpetuation of gender stereotypes. Okay, now we come to the third issue, realism versus constructivism. So the last debate to consider is transdisciplinary and most famous perhaps in painting and philosophy. It can be put in this way. Should music reproduction aim at realism 
or should it aim at construction, at interpretation, at artifice? And how does the goal of transparency relate? Is a window to the past possible? So if we think about this in terms of realism, some audiophiles, engineers, and theorists of different stripes argue that the best stereo component is what they call a straight wire with gain. This means that the goal of any component is to amplify, then convey the music with as little added or taken away as possible. Do not distort, do not color. Up the chain, earlier than the final phase of home playback, there are mixing and recording engineers, and their task is to neutrally convey the sound, keeping their thumbs off the scale as well. So if everyone rows in the same direction, the outcome should be transparency, a clear view back to the performance. And such purism was lauded by conductor and musician Pierre Boulez, who argued that with recordings, one can and ought to hear exactly what was played. Philosopher Joshua Glasgow frames the issue in this way. He says, a, re a recording is transparent when it sounds like the original performance itself sounded. He adds, this is a modest and limited goal. High fidelity aesthetics is an intuitively plausible position. It holds that a recording can capture what it records accurately without distortion. So he calls this modest because the goal is not for the recording to be the best possible rendition that you could ever hear or even realistic in all possible ways, like you feel like you're sitting in a seat and there's someone next to you and stuff like that, but it's just better at getting us closer to the sonic performances. These are the philosophical ways of, of putting the goal, and of course there's rhetoric in the world of everyday life. Another way of thinking about this issue is in terms of constructivism. Uh, there are other audiophiles who argue that transparency is impossible or misguided, and there are so many factors that influence the resultant recording that the objective must be shaped using the sounds that are there and the, and the materials that are there to create an imaginary that is rich and varied enough to want to inhabit. As Andy Hamilton points out, transparency is a difficult position to maintain. However one presents the transparency thesis, it faces the obvious challenge that recordings are artifacts. The recorded image, like the photographic image, is always crafted. So listening too is theory laden, he argues. Realistic reproduction or fidelity is relative to playback, and playback is relative to a set of listener expectations. So the philosophical issues here multiplies in many different directions, and I just want to pick two of quick interest. One has to do with perception. What is happening when we perceive reproduced music, reproduced audio? If we're initially passive, then transparency is a sensible goal. But if Dewey and Mark Johnson are right, then music is approached with interests already alive. Music is actively taken. It's enacted in an embodied way. So on this model, there is no correspondence that somehow goes back to an originary moment. As Johnson puts it, the meaning of music is precisely this dancing kind of embodied meaning. Music does not typically represent anything, even though there may occasionally be a few representative elements in a particular musical work. Music's function is instead presentation and enactment of felt experience. So the organism involved in music on this Dewey-Johnson approach views art as an experience, as a dynamic and interactive activity, a circuitry. Right? What's wished for in, a music's re in music's reproduction is not the production of an isomorphic sim simulacrum, but a sympathetic feeling which works through the recipient. Another topic here has to do with the philosophy of media. What is the nature of mediation in the delivery of sound? Earlier, Jonathan Stern had decried transparency's dream of verisimilitude, disputing the idea that the primary purpose of media is to reproduce experience as it unfolds in life. This dream rests on a mistaken concept of media, and clearly then a philosophical account of media and the ontological constitution of its objects and events is key. As Stern writes, media are not middle terms, intervening in otherwise more primary, fundamental, or organic relationships. Mediation is not necessarily intercession, filtering, or representation, but can be considered relational causality, a movement from one set of relations to another. As Adorno wrote, mediation is in the object itself, not something between the object and that to which it is brought.
So to put this another way, the transmission theory of music, the one which aims for a neutral, transparent conveyance of the original reality, sees each element in the sequence atomically connected contingently. But on a model premised on continuity, elements and sequences have heuristic reality only. They are more profitably understood as interdependent and co-constitutive. So this understanding of mediation aligns with Johnson's account of the enactment of musical meaning, which builds upon Suzanne Langer's ideas. As Langer put it, a work of art does not point us to a meaning beyond its own presence. What is expressed cannot be grasped apart from the sensuous or poetic form that expresses it. In a work of art, we have the direct presentation of a feeling, not a sign that points to it. So, in conclusion, meaning-making is central to human purposes. How we create, understand, and experience meaning is the province of aesthetics in its wider sense. Both technology and art play profound roles, interdependent roles, in our meaning-making. So this paper has sought to investigate one more way to move from the level of everyday life, the enjoyment of sound and music, through the technologies that facilitate and shape it, down to the conceptual assumptions and values which await excavation and discussion. I hope I have made some headway today, and I would welcome your comments, questions, and ideas for further exploration. Thank you so much for listening.